here. Okay, lecture 19 of the course and lecture 2 on superconductivity. So we've um, seen the phenomenon, the effects, um, and now we're going to uh, see some details and explanations of why things superconduct. We'll see some theoretical descriptions. Uh, so to, to get us started, um, a quick reminder, superconductivity, complete loss of electrical resistance by certain materials below certain temperature, also below certain field, below certain magnetic field. So there is a critical temperature, critical field to it. So this is the first experimental observation on uh, mercury, which showed to the accuracy of 10 to the minus 5 ohms that this particular specimen had no resistance. And then since then, we improved this uh, upper bound on resistance uh, dramatically. And we really cannot find any resistance in the superconducting state. But this is not the entire phenomenology of this state. It's not just that it's zero resistance, which may, means it's a perfect conductor. It is also a perfect diamagnet below a critical field, of course. Um, and this is manifest in the Meissner effect. Meissner effect is a complete exclusion of all magnetic fields from the vol volume of the superconductor. So above the critical temperature, magnetic field can just pierce through, like in a standard metal. If you have a metal, you can just pass magnetic field right through it. Uh, but below critical temperature, no magnetic field goes in. All the magnetic field goes around. So how is this achieved? There is a um, current, a supercurrent circulating at the on the perimeter of the uh, specimen screening the magnetic field. So the total field is zero inside due to the field created by the screening current and the external field. OK, so um, uh, the good news is that by now we have a fairly complete uh, an elegant theory of conventional superconductivity. So I told you those high temperature superconductors, there is really a lot of uncertainty there. But these conventional ones like mercury, niobium, aluminum, we understand in great details. And that's what today's lecture is going to be about. But uh, interestingly, this understanding came some 45 years after superconductivity was observed. So this 1911 plot that I just showed you, and then add to that, fast forward to 1956 or 57, when that theory was created. So in the meantime, in that window, 45 or 46 years, there were various attempts to understand superconductivity. And some of them were very useful. So we're going to start with one of those theories. So not the full theory, but just one of the theories uh, which is called the London theory after two people, two London brothers that uh, sort of postulated it. And it's an attempt to include these two experimental observations in one theory. So Meissner effect and zero, con uh, zero resistivity. Right? So those, just those two, and they wrote uh, something like quasi- Maxwell's equations, but uh, applied to a superconductor. Of course, Maxwell's equations are always satisfied, even in a superconducting state. There is no question about it. So this is not an alternative to Maxwell's equations. These are just uh, versions of Maxwell's equations, to use a technical term, with a particular gauge. And they could not really derive these equations. They just used them because they gave them what they wanted. So this is what they are. So here's the first London equation. And it has the current here and electric fields, right? So um, what this reminds you of, which, which fundamental law? Ohm's law? Ohm's law? No. So because in Ohm's law, dg dt, uh, dj dt is equal to 0, right? So Ohm's law would connect j, right? j will be some conductivity times the electric field, right? That's Ohm's law. So if we take a derivative of this, then dj dt will be 0. Now here, dj dt is not 0. So in fact, 
Ohm's law does not work in a superconductor because sigma is uh, infinite, right? And uh, rho is zero, so Ohm's law does not work. But uh, so this is a version of you know combine some of the same parameters but with dg dt. So j is the current density, right? So we have to write charge of a particle times the velocity, right? Times maybe the density of particles to get j, right? So what is this derived from then? Oh yeah, for, elect for voltage or electric field, sorry, this electric field, we have to write force divided by charge. Way, way back in your physics subconsciousness, what does this formula remind you of? Okay, so J is this, then DJ DT is E DV DT. Which law is this? Okay, we have DV DT on one side and F Newton's second law okay yeah. thank you thank you <laughs> okay so this is actually Newton's second law so what's the idea okay resistivity is zero so there isn't this steady state solution which we have in conductors like metals where we apply a fixed potential difference fixed voltage we create an electric field but particles which are experiencing the you know the Lorentz force and the Coulomb force Particles that are experiencing a force are not moving with an acceleration on average, but they're moving with a constant drift velocity, right? So this, this Druder formula doesn't work because resistivity is zero. So this is what they wrote instead. So they imagined that if you were to put electric field in a superconductor, particles would actually accelerate. And that's what this, this formula is. Okay, so the second uh, London equation you can actually derive from the first one, which is a nice feature of this, uh, of this uh, theory. Okay, so this is your equation. Then we can take a curl um, of, well, of both sides of it. Uh, then we will have a curl of electric field, and we know that that's minus dB dt. That's Maxwell's equation, right? That's Faraday's law, to save you the trouble. <laughs> That's, is it first Faraday law or second? <laughs> no, there is only one Faraday law. Okay, so then we take, okay, so then we, on the left side we have a curl of dj dt, so that's this term. Uh, and on the right side we have db dt with a minus sign, so we bring it to the, to the left, right? And we have this, this expression. The time derivative of this is equal to zero. Okay, okay so uh, what, are these, what do these numbers mean? Uh, well, turns out that one of them is, uh, becomes external flux and the other one becomes flux induced by current. If you go from this uh, local representation of Maxwell's equations with curls and gradients uh, to a, uh, the integrated one, right? So we can integrate uh, over the, this equation over an area. And so from here we go to here. So we have uh, the same two terms, but now integrated over an area. And then the first term, we can transform it uh, into J D, integral JDL, right? Using the which theorem? I think it's Stokes theorem, right? Stokes theorem. Right. So then uh, the second one is just flux, right? You can see the second term is flux. So this is this is flux, and the first term is also flux, 
but due to circulating current. And you can see that the two terms, uh, for this to always be true, the two terms have to cancel each other. And so you arrive to this second equation, which essentially is Meissner effect, which shows that you have perfect screening. So flux created by the current is exactly equal to flux created by the field in the same area, or in the same volume, right? So this is perfect screening, and it can actually be derived from uh, uh, this London equation, which, again, actually they cannot derive it. They just postulated it. But it gives us a Meissner effect, so it's very nice. And this is the, just the integrated form of the same equation. These are just two ways to write the same thing. So this is how, how from London theory you get some validation of uh, these two important observations. Zero resistivity is kind of postulated here, but then Meissner effect you can derive using this particular equation. Okay. So this was 1935, right? 20 years before we got the theory of superconductivity and already quite a bit of success. And success went actually even further uh, because another thing that you can uh, understand uh, using these equations is that a uh, field is supposed to actually penetrate a little bit into the superconductor. Okay? So this, this screening is not absolutely perfect. There is a little layer around the surface where there is a little bit of field which is then getting screened. And so this, uh, this is how it works. So this is the equation from the previous slide. This is the London's equation. And we also have this other Maxwell's equation, right, that connects B to J. Curl B is equal to J. So we can take <clears throat> another curl of both sides. Curl, curl. And then we have curl J on the right-hand side, and we have curl J in here, in this London equation. So this is London equation. London equation number two gives us the connection between curl J and B. So we take this curl J and we plug it into here and we get this equation. Or gradi uh, gradient of the divergence is equal to zero. That's always zero. Uh, so this term disappears. So we have this equation that connects basically the second derivative of field to field, right? So that's a differential equation. And we know the solution of this equation, right? Can remember the solution of this equation. So it connects the second derivative to the variable itself. It's an exponential, right? And because there is a minus sign between them, this is actually a decaying exponential. So not a growing exponential, but a decaying exponential. Okay, so this means that field exponentially decays into the superconductor. So here you have, outside the superconductor, you have external field B0, B0. And then as you go in to the superconductor, there is actually a layer of a certain thickness where the field decays, but still non-zero. So of course, in principle, it decays forever, but we can define this characteristic length scale that characterizes how deep the field penetrates. And we call it a London penetration depth, lambda L. So L stands for London. Um, and to distinguish it from other parameters uh, and or penetration depth obtained from other theories. This one is London penetration depth. And from this equation, we can actually relate it to various parameters from London's equations, such as mass density of superconducting particles. We, they did not know what those particles were, but they assume that there is some density of them that because they conduct, so they mu there must be some charges flowing. 
Um, so they probably would get, uh, you know, charge of the superconducting particle, which they probably assume to be equal to the charge of the electron. But we know that actually it's two electrons, charge of two electrons. And some, some constants, mass, mu naught. And this is a characteristic length scale. So by the 1,000 angstroms or 100 nanometers is how far magnetic field penetrates into a superconductor. So for any finite size piece of superconductor, even for a superconducting wire that is often, often finds applications in things like superconducting magnets, uh, this is uh, not so important, this length scale. 100 nanometers, if you have a millimeter thick or a fraction of a millimeter thick object, it's not so important. But of course, it's important for the, the nanoscale devices and uh, these kind of things. So then it becomes comparable to the device size, then it becomes really, really important. Okay. So that was the success of London theory. And then there were several other theories that I'm going to skip for in the view of time. But one of them included, for example, a two-fluid model. So um, a model where you have a superfluid, superconducting condensate as we now know it, coexisting, being in parallel with a normal fluid, resistive fluid. And you can pass so much flux through the you know, flow of charge through the superfluid. And then if you exceed some critical velocity, then you start, uh, charge starts flowing through the normal fluid. And then the, uh, the model also had quite some success. OK, fast forward another 20 years. Now this is the true uh, story of what's happening in these superconductors. And I already started discussing this with you last time, but um, nevertheless, this is the summary. So uh, rather than uh, electrons uh, being independent, they are forming bound states which are called Cooper pairs. After Leon Cooper, who uh, is a theorist who conceptualized them, um, and uh, it is a bizarre effect uh, because two negatively charged particles form an attractive state. Um, and uh, the way that happens is by electron-phonon interaction. Now, this is the story in all conventional superconductors. There is electron-phonon interaction, and it uh, brings electrons together. Uh, we'll see in more detail how that happens. I'll motivate it for you in the next slides. Uh, but I, now I want to say that this is not necessarily the case in high temperature superconductors. In these unconventional superconductors, we don't know precisely the mechanism, why there are Cooper pairs. However, there are Cooper pairs, the same story, particles of charge 2E, making bound states and forming a condensate. There is Meissner effect. All these things are there. It's just that we don't know what binds them together precisely. There are various ideas, various schools of thought, various interesting fights happening to, dis to decide what those are. OK, so um, what are Cooper pairs? Cooper pairs in all conventional superconductors are bound states of electrons, but it's not just any electrons that get bound. It is necessarily two electrons moving with opposite momenta, opposite momenta and opposite spin. Okay. So it's a, like a cartoon picture. The, the, the full story is more complicated, but this is a good picture to have in mind for now. Now, the total spin state of a Cooper pair is singlet, spin singlet. Two particles with spins anti-parallel. It's a spin singlet. Um, and it is a particle with then zero spin, which means it's a boson. So uh, they undergo this Bose-Einstein condensation. Characteristic size of a Cooper pair 
is called the coherence length. And it's denoted by psi. Coherence length. And this is one formula to how to estimate psi knowing the superconducting gap uh, and the, the velocity of, of uh, electrons. Uh, now, um, what does it mean, the size of a Cooper pair? It's a very tricky concept, but again, to have a cartoon in your head, uh, electrons actually fly freely in a superconductor how they want. They don't bind together and then fly together. That's not what happens, right? So they don't form a bound, like a molecule state, and then that molecule moves around like a Cooper pair. They actually are free to go, but they constantly exchange these phonons which keeps them sort of correlated, right? So they are, they are moving with their own trajectories, but they are correlated. So they are in these uh, quantum states. If one scatters, then the other one scatters, or you can think about it forming a Cooper pair with another electron because they're indistinguishable. So they remain in these kind of states, but they can actually scatter around and bounce around. And so well, as they bounce around, uh, this is a typical scale uh, uh, on, on which there are these correlations between them. So let's say two electrons that are farther apart than this coherence length will not be correlated into a Cooper pair. The electrons that are a little bit closer together, they, they can be. So this is uh, one you know, zeroth approximation for uh, what happens in a superconductor. Okay. So we have bosons, though, so they can uh, condense. And um, they all uh, exist in the same ground state. That's what this theory of Cooper pairs uh, teaches us. Um, and um, what that manifests is that there is a gap. There is this gap, and so this excess is energy. And this axis is the density of states. Uh, so there is a gap at zero, which zero it means the Fermi uh, level position. Right? Now, this gap is for single particle states. So what it means is that around Fermi level, within the gap, within delta, which delta is the, is the name for this gap, uh, within delta there are no unbound electrons. They are in Cooper pairs. Okay. They are in Cooper pairs and all Cooper pairs are kind of at zero energy. So they condense there. And unbound electrons are only allowed to live outside. outside. Uh, and then there are these characteristic features. There are these peaks in the density of states. And these are the single particle states that were misplaced displaced from the gap. So stuff in these ears, those states were previously inside the gap. And then because this gap formed, they were pushed outside the gap and they pile up outside to make these quasi-particle peaks. So when people measure various uh, properties, electrical properties, sometimes they see these peaks, these ears, and these are the quasi-particle peaks which tell you unmistakably that this is the superconducting gap that you're looking at. Okay. Questions? Okay, so um, why does this happen? Why does this gap occur? It's because Cooper pairing is favorable. So Cooper, what actually, his paper, what he showed is that there is this Cooper instability. You add a little bit of electron phonon interaction and the system at zero temperature prefers to form Cooper pairs, and then they condense. So this is a lower energy state for the system uh, than, uh, than the uncondensed state when they are uncorrelated. OK. Now, because we are uh, talking about these particles here in the middle of the gap, these Cooper pairs, uh, they are all in the same quantum state in the entire big chunk of superconductor, they all occupy the same wave function. And we write this wave function. It is just a number 
with an amplitude and a phase. And there is this notion of macroscopic quantum coherence, which means that anywhere you go inside a superconductor, you're going to get the same amplitude of this function. And in the absence of fields, uh, also the same phase everywhere. Okay. Fields make the phase wind, as we will see later on. So you can see already that this is a, not such a simple picture. You can actually get quite confused. For example, I told you that the coherence length of, is, a, is a small number. It could be a micron, could be 100 nanometers. Uh, so on the, on the one hand, it suggests that coherence persists over a micron. But on the other hand, I'm telling you there is macroscopic coherence. No matter how big I make the superconductor, the wave function is the same. So that's how it is. <laughs> no, so the confusion comes from uh, people misunderstanding what coherence length is. And uh, even though it tells you um, what is the length scale at which correlations between two electrons exist, uh, it uh, does not address the question that all of the particles are in the same ground state no matter where you are. Okay? So there is this macroscopic quantum coherence. There is no contradiction. Uh, here, but uh, we'll, we'll take too long to explain this. So I'll just kind of state that there is no contradiction here. Okay. Um, all right. So um, as I already mentioned, there is an energy gap, uh, and uh, this uh, gap closes as you approach TC. That's the picture. So. Here it is, the gap normalized to the zero temperature value. And then as we increase temperature and we reach 1, which is Tc, gap goes to zero. So this gap op starts to open up as we go into the superconducting state and it grows. So which is also uh, fairly easy to uh, absorb, right, to understand why this is supposed to be the case, because this is an energy gap. And to destroy superconducting state, you need to give the system energy which is greater than the gap. So at the transition temperature, uh, you just have uh, that amount of energy. And any zero amount of extra energy will kick you out of the state. So then at Tc, gap should be zero. And then why does it have this uh, dependence? Actually. Uh, I think BCS theory, which we are describing, the Cooper, Cooper is the C in this theory, Bardeen Cooper Schiffer theory, uh, does not explain this dependence. The theory of Cooper pairs lives right here at zero temperature, at very low temperature. So this Cooper pairing theory that I'm going through works very well here. So this is the BCS, Bardeen Cooper Schiffer are three theorists who explain superconductivity. They explain this part. Then there is also a very nice theory, which we're going to touch upon, which explains this part. And that's the Ginsburg-Landau theory. So that's coming up a little bit. I'm going to flash it for you. OK. So how can two electrons attract? Well, this is one cartoon that I found, which uh, is kind of nice, although not doesn't tell you the full story. But if you just imagine uh, a row of nuclei, which are ions, positively charged, uh, and two electrons traveling together on either side of that row. So you can see how, because there is this positive charge in between, they're going to get attracted and then here they will see each other, they will maybe get repelled a bit, and then they go again close to the ion, and then they get attracted. And so mediated by ions in the crystal lattice, uh, this is the, a very naive cartoon of how two negatively charged particles can get attracted because there, is just a, there are just some positive charges around. Right? So the, the more correct picture is, uh, of course, that um, 
there is an interaction between these two guys, uh, and then uh, the ion displaces a little bit, um, and then pulls a little bit on the other electron. So that's the electron phonon coupling in action. That's how it happens uh, in, in materials. So you can imagine uh, estimating the, the, the size of the Cooper pair from this uh, naive uh, picture of uh, coupling through the lattice. Uh, so imagine you had um, an electron flying in some direction through a lattice, and then you launch the phonon by electron-phonon coupling. And then that phonon has to travel and reach another electron to uh, make them interact and then fall into a Cooper pair. Uh, so then um, here are some characteristic time scales. Omega d related to phonons. What is it? Debye frequency, right? So Debye frequency tells us how long it will take. That's a characteristic time scale for how long it will take for this phonon, this polarization, uh, to travel through the lattice. So that's 10 to the minus 13 seconds for a typical solid. Um, now, typical Fermi velocity is a million. Uh, now you take the ratio of the two, and you get a characteristic size of a Cooper pair, which is pretty close to what people find. A micron, 100 nanometers, 10 to the minus 7 meters just by doing this very hand-waving uh, hand uh, argument. And it also tells you what, uh, what to expect, why, how electron-phonon interaction comes into play here. OK, so um, then there were uh, various confirmations of this theory, of this bardeen cooper schrieffer theory, after it was discovered that there is a connection between electron-phonon interaction and superconductivity, then you can make a number of tests for whether things work, right? And one of the tests is still a theoretical test in a way, uh, but um, there is a prediction from the BCS theory what should be the connection between TC and uh, this electron phonon interaction strength. Right? So the prediction is that it depends on Debye's temperature, and it also depends on uh, this interaction with the lattice. So in some materials, uh, you can independently measure that phonons interact stronger with electrons, and in other materials, they interact weaker. And so this is this what goes into this U, and D is the density of states at the Fermi level. That always comes into play because that's how many electrons you have available to interact with. Okay, so that always comes into play, and that's, for example, why semiconductors uh, are never or hardly ever superconducting because there are not so many electrons around to create that uh, enough interaction. So there's the density of states terms kill the prospects for various materials to superconduct. If it's a thousand times smaller, it will be a thousand times smaller TC, and then you cannot measure it anymore. OK, so then, of course, you can, you knowing the Debye temperatures of various materials, you can go and check whether uh, this formula makes sense, and it does make sense oftentimes. Uh, so that's good. Uh, but there is a more dramatic uh, test that people have done. So, um, first of all, remember I told you gold, copper, silver, they don't, su don't superconduct. They are the best conductors that we have, but they don't superconduct. Yeah. So this fits squarely with the BCS theory. And why is that? It's because the reason why they're good conductors is because there is a weak electron phonon coupling. So the very thing that makes superconductivity is suppressed there. So we have them as excellent conductors, but not superconductors. Right? So that is, that is the story with those. Um, and then another wonderful thing was that people have found this isotope effect. 
and they went looking for it after BCS theory came. Uh, and the isotope effect is that uh, you take the same material, mercury for example, right, and you take different isotopes of mercury. You, you purify to different isotopes and you make compounds of different uh, atomic mass. And you can imagine if you change the mass of the nucleus of the ion by adding a proton or so or a neutron, uh, then that iron becomes heavier and electron phonon coupling changes. Right? And so the lighter the nucleus, the stronger is the electron phonon coupling because the larger you can displace the nuclei. And people have found in many materials this relationship between the critical temperature of superconductivity, so the, the strength of the superconducting coupling, the energy scale of that, and which isotope they use. So here are the atomic masses of different isotopes. And it's also plotted for, uh, for the uh, slight renormalization of the, of the crystal lattice here. And they found that as materials get heavier, Tc goes down. So that was a spectacular demonstration of the validity of the bardeen cooper schieffer theory uh, one of the one of the first ones, and uh, then there were other things. For example, the the singlet spin singlet nature of Cooper pairing was confirmed by nuclear magnetic resonance measurements. Um, in the years after BCS theory was introduced, there were several of these powerful validations. Okay, so back to our table. These are all BCS superconductors, meaning they are described by this theory very well. And also things that are not superconducting uh, can be understood. So we just understood uh, this part now. This is weak electron phonon coupling. And now let's revisit uh, this part. Actually nickel as well. So these are magnetic, right? These are, this is a Iron, copper, nickel are really ferromagnets, and then chromium, manganese are almost. They are very strong paramagnets. So um, what's the problem there? Well, it's the spin singlet nature of Cooper pairing. So if your electrons need to be in this anti-parallel state to condense into Cooper pairs, and here you have these magnetic moments uh, and uh, certain couplings in these materials that want to align them like this, make them ferromagnetic or strongly paramagnetic. There is a strong tendency to align all the spins in the same direction. So there is a conflict right, between the two, and magnetism wins in this case. So now we understand, understand this. We also understand why magnetic impurities strongly suppress superconductivity. So you take one of these superconducting materials, niobium, molybdenum, and you add a bit of iron, and Tc goes down. That's because Cooper pairs flying around see these spins from iron, and they get destroyed their correlation gets destroyed from due to spin-dependent scattering off of the magnetic impurities. Okay. Okay, so that was a very successful theory. Uh, you can understand uh, by using the concept of a condensate why there could be supercurrent, current flowing without resistance. Um, and this is, uh, can be understood by considering the single particle spectrum in a superconductor. So single particle excitations described by this formula and what's wonderful about this formula is that here you have the parabolic dispersion like for free electrons, right? But because it's combined with this delta squared term and the square root, then uh, for small momentum p uh, there is a strong distortion to this parabola and what happens is rather than going uh, through zero, this dispersion relation has this uh, flat bottom here 
and the size of this uh, lifting is exactly delta, the superconducting gap. So this just tells you in another formula that there cannot be single particle unpaired electrons in the energy window between zero and the superconducting gap. They are not allowed because it costs you energy delta to excite one of these things. Okay? So then this is how you can understand a condensate. So you can give uh, a center of mass momentum to the entire condensate. And in that reference frame, it will still be at rest, but there will be a supercurrent flowing in the lab frame. Then if you go too far with that, uh, you exceed a critical momentum, a critical current, then there will be an excitation. Okay, so this is how you get a supercurrent. So co all Cooper pairs are in the same state with total momentum being the same. If there is no current, K is equal to zero. If there is a supercurrent, K is not equal to zero. But then if K is too large, then it becomes advantageous to create single particles rather than Cooper pairs, break Cooper pairs. And then uh, you go out of this superconducting state. Okay, another interesting consequence of the BCS theory. Um, for that, we need to consider a superconductor that is bent into a ring. So this is a continuous ring of a superconductor. Uh, and now remember what I told you that this entire piece of superconductor, even when it's a ring, has to be described by a wave function Maybe this is a function of angle if there is magnetic field, but it is a single wave function, right? So think back to your quantum mechanics. Of course, this is made of billions of electrons. It's a macroscopic state, but it is just a single wave function. So there should be Schrodinger equation satisfied for this wave function with all of the wave function properties. And in particular, if you go around the loop once, the wave function has to be single valued, right? So there is a kind of a born uh, Sommerfeld quantization here, right? You think about uh, this wave function as describing a particle, a single particle or a single wave. Uh, then you need to have an integer number of wavelengths fitting into this ring for the wave function to be single valued. And so you can say that the length of the ring has to be equal to the number of wavelengths, and you can rewrite the wavelength as some momentum. That's the momentum of the condensate, how it moves around the loop. Um, so this total momentum. Uh, and there should be a, this, this relationship, or more generally, uh, if you integrate momentum around the loop, it has to satisfy has to be n times h bar. That is just because it's a wave function, right? which we know from BCS theory. Bose-Einstein condensate. OK. So then um, we, have, we can replace this momentum with a proper quantum mechanical momentum, uh, which includes the vector potential allows for the, uh, what's it called? Uh, let me see, I forgot. Uh, what's this, the name of this momentum when you include vector potential? K, k, k. You know, from like relativity. OK, blanking out on this one. But um, nevertheless, that's the proper extended definition of momentum in the presence of a magnetic field. Um, and we can go from P here to J by uh, this, uh, the same math that I already showed you before. Uh, so then we have an equation uh, which is the same quantization condition, right? We have N H bar on the right, but this is the, the extended definition of um, 
Lorentz transformation something. There is a name for this. Anyhow, uh, this includes the current density and the uh, vector potential. Or you can go from this vector potential to magnetic field by uh, the Stokes theorem. Um, and you can convince yourself that this second term here uh, is external flux through the loop. And the first term is um, circulating current. Okay. So then what this means is that this value here can only take integer values. So this is a bizarre idea. So we are restricting what kind of current can flow through a ring of superconductor or we're restricting what kind of um, flux can penetrate the superconductor, can only go in integer values. Right? So this comes from the continuity of the wave function. And this is a macroscopic effect, whereas the continuity of the wave function, we typically see it on the atomic scale. That gives us the orbitals of atoms, for example. This is, you can make this ring 10 meters in diameter. 30 feet. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Okay. Um, all right. So um, there is, in fact, if we uh, if we put a j to zero here, if we uh, make let's say the inductance of the loop very large. J will be very small. Um, we can put the j to, j to zero. Then we can define this quantum of flux. So flux in a ring of superconductor can be quantized. Uh, and the value of that flux is about 10 to the minus 15. It's h over 2e. So it's just fundamental constants, right? A very fundamental value here. Where does this 2 come from? The Cooper pairs, right. So that's because there is a particle of charge 2e traveling around. Okay. All right. So this was observed many times. This is one of the first, maybe the first observation in physical review letters. Uh, and what they've measured is, well, they've done this experiment. They have applied the field, and they had a way to measure flux in this loop. And they found that even though they apply a field continuously, is field and Gauss, the flux in, in the loop goes in steps rather than just uh, doing the screening, for example, like you expect from Meissner effect, right, which would be a straight line, or not changing whatsoever as you expect from a classical conductor. You can just ramp magnetic field as much as you like. If you do it slow enough, there will be no difference between the applied field and the flux. Um, well, for Meissner effect, it depends on where you measure, inside or outside. Um, but here you have these steps. And interestingly, uh, they found already in the first measurement that it was hc over 2e. So this is now in the uh, SI system, so there is a speed of light uh, there as well. But there is hc over 2e, even though they were working off of the, uh, some theoretical prediction that it would be hc over e. So they already uh, saw that this was due to Cooper pairs, although strange because this paper is already after the, the theory was available. So I'm not sure what's going on there. OK, very interesting effect. And we'll come back to it uh, later. Uh, now. Uh, there are other instances where we have these quantized fluxes in superconductors. An important one is this one, a uh, story of two classes of superconductors, type 1 and type 2. Um, and um, the difference is in the details of Meissner effect. And this is how uh, you can start understanding the two classes. 
Let's talk about type 1, which is what we've been discussing so far, pretty much. We were just talking about type 1. Uh, and so in type 1, you will not be surprised uh, when I tell you what happens. Uh, there is just a Meissner effect that works up to the critical temperature. So if you apply magnetic field to a type 1 superconductor, we are on this red trace. There is a magnetization created uh, inside, which is directly opposite to the magnetic field applied. So there is this straight line with a slope of 1. Uh, and then that story ends as soon as you exceed the critical field and you go out of the superconducting state, then the magnetization goes to zero at this field HC. Okay. So that's the story with type 1 superconductors. Uh, and now there are also uh, very important superconductors, which are called type 2. Uh, and why are they important is because actually superconductivity typically survives to much, much higher fields. So this HC2 here is not just randomly farther away, but it is uh, typically the case. Uh, however, the magnetization does not follow this perfect Meissner formula after some point HC1. So there is this region between HC1 and HC2, which is called the mixed state. And it's obvious from this trace, the blue trace, is that partially magnetic field does penetrate into the superconductor. And so this is in violation, obviously, of the simple London theory of the 1935, which those equations would just tell you that it just excludes everything. And this can be happening for large samples, so we cannot just explain it with the fact that penetration depth is of the size of the sample. Uh, so none of that. Um, so these are very interesting and important materials for the high HC2. Uh, but uh, they are a little more complex. So what tends to happen in those materials is that magnetic flux goes through the sample above the field HC1. So below HC1, we just have Meissner effect and perfect screening. And then you exceed this HC1, and flux starts to go in, but it goes in in these sort of vortices. So these vortices are objects where uh, magnetic flux goes through. There is a circulating current around. Uh, and in between vortices, there is a superconductor. So the white spots here are vortices. There are various ways to image them. I'll show you maybe one of them next time. Uh, but there are various ways to image them. And um, this is, so this is one of the actual images of vortices without scales, I apologize. But, uh, we will see well, how big they are in a moment. Uh, and in between, it's a superconducting state. And in the vortex, there is this flux going through. Okay. So um, OK, very interesting objects, these vortices. But uh, very interesting to understand why is this happening? Why is there, no, why is there a breakdown of Meissner effect? Um, uh, and so um, we're going to spend a bit of time on these vortices. So this is what. Uh, now a schematic of what they are. Um, you have a, a slab of superconductor, and apparently it becomes uh, energetically favorable, but only if you are this type 2. Uh, so rather than expel flux from the entire volume of the superconductor, to let it penetrate uh, in, these, in these vortices. And interestingly, flux associated with each vortex is um, H over 2E. So it's a flux quantum that goes through. OK, now this you can uh, understand, right? Because now in a vortex, superconductivity is actually suppressed because you have a large magnetic field. And we know that when you have a large magnetic field, then uh, superconductivity is killed. So in, this, in the vortex, in the core, you have a normal phase. That's what happens. and then. Around it, you have the superconducting phase. So then uh, a normal phase creates effectively a hole in a superconductor. And then going around the hole, the wave function has to come back to, its, to the original value. And that means that 
flux needs to be quantized, as we argued just two slides ago. Right? So that explains why each vortex has, carries this flux of h over 2e. Right? It's a kind of a neat effect because you just uh, apply magnetic field and then you create all these vortices. So why are they called vortices? That's because there is a screening current protecting the rest of the superconducting state, right? So now you have magnetic field inside. B is not equal to zero in the middle, but around it in the purple, you have a superconducting state. So then you need to protect that, and so you create a screening current to counteract this flux. And so this, the, the screening current is what makes a vortex. So to understand why this happens, we use this other theory of superconductivity. Uh, and this one uh, does not consider the microscopic mechanism uh, of how electrons bind in Cooper pairs, what is the ground state wave function, and uh, all these important questions that BCS theory addressed. Rather, it looks at the energetics. What's energetically favorable, what's unfavorable, and it uses some very general arguments, uh, even though it was, this theory was also kind of postulated and then later reconciled with the BCS theory another 20 years later. So it was initially just postulated based on some general considerations. And this theory is all about calculating the, the free energies of different states. So for example, uh, it postulates that the free energy of the superconducting state, Fs, um, for, to get that, we need to add to the free energy of the normal state these two terms, which are proportional to the wave function. So this is a pretty bizarre leap in intuition. This was actually intuition. So was, I think it was Landau who said, well, this has to be the wave function turned out to be correct. But he was a, a crazy genius, uh, not crazy, but a complete genius, and so th that's OK. Uh, it's kind of expected of him. If he didn't do this once per day, then people got frustrated. Um, OK, so, uh, but, but there is some motivation to it, right? So uh, for example, you can see the psi squared term, then that's the density, right? Square of the wave function is a density. So that's the density of superconducting electrons. Right? So that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, and then the, this psi to the fourth term, where did that come from? Well, he needed it to sort of stabilize this thing. Because otherwise, uh, if alpha is negative, this coefficient alpha is negative, then uh, the function will run away, go to infinity. So psi infinity will have an infinite negative energy. So then he, he added this term. And then he also had an argument that odd, odd powers should not be there because they violate some fundamental symmetries of space. Right? So psi and psi cubed are not good because uh, you, know, you can have psi can be a complex number, and then psi or psi cubed will give you complex energy, which is uh, not, not a good thing. OK. so. So basically, that's the entire theory. So then you say, OK, um, this is the energy of being in a superconducting state versus being in a normal state. It's just the difference between these two. Fs minus Fn is proportional to this uh, functional. Uh, and like I said, it's density. And then he said, OK, uh, coefficient alpha obviously is the critical one here, and that can be temperature dependent, magnetic field dependent, and don't really care why, what, and why it depends on these parameters. But let's just, let us just, for example, change sign and change the magnitude as a function of some parameters. Okay, so that's a phenomenological theory rather than microscopic theory, which considers how electrons couple and condense and so on. So it's a phenomenological theory, but a very powerful theory. So this is what you can do with this. Uh, you look at the energy gain or loss 
if you go into the superconducting state. So Fs minus Fn is proportional to these two terms. And now, uh, if alpha and beta are both positive, then we are on the red curve here. It's a parabola. And what that tells us is that psi, the x-axis there, is 0. That's the solution. May energy is minimized for psi equal to 0. Right? So what can you do with the free energy? You Functional, you want to minimize it to find the physical solution. Right? That's what we have to do. Okay, so then let alpha be negative. Then we have a situation where if you solve this function, there will be the uh, psi to the fourth term, which wants to go up. And there is a psi to the second term, which wants to go down. So then depending on the ratio of alpha and beta, there might be these two minima. And that means that to minimize energy, the system will choose a non-zero wave function amplitude. And by the way, psi in this theory is called order parameter. It's kind of an unintuitive name for a wave function, but uh, that's because this exact same theory applies to many different phase transitions. For example, you can also write something like this for a ferromagnetic phase transition. And then there will be a different quantity here, not the wave function, but it will be the magnetization. And then the name becomes clear. So order parameter, right? So the more ordered system is a more magnetized system. So you go into the phase transition where you have this magnetization, which is order. And it parametrizes into this equation. So in fact, the superconducting state is also more ordered than the normal state because you have this condensate of Cooper pairs. So the name also kind of makes sense. But, but um, I, might, I might call it order parameter because uh, I'm used to it. So don't, don't be surprised. You, I just mean the wave function. OK, so there is actually a position for the minimum. Uh, which is minus alpha over beta, is uh, what this theory will tell you the order parameter should be. And that, that means you can understand what alpha and beta should be if you know the BCS theory. Right. So if you know what to expect from the order parameter from psi, then you can figure out alpha and beta if you have that other part. OK, so. Um, Or if you did a measurement on a superconductor. So for example, this is then the difference between superconducting in normal state in terms of the parameters alpha and beta because I plugged in psi equal to minus alpha over beta into here. And this is what I get. Uh, so then I also know that uh, I can kill superconductivity by magnetic field. I need to go to the critical field. So then I know that this difference is just given by the magnetic field energy. Okay. So I think because it's a small f, it's actually energy density rather than energy. And that's why I write the energy density of magnetic field here. Um, and from this, I can work out how critical field is connected to these parameters alpha and beta. Yeah. So this is, uh, so then if I measure something else like TC, I can probably have a couple of equations and figure out what alpha and beta should be in terms of the measured parameters. Right, so that's a very powerful energy, now uh, powerful theory. Now let's see how that gives us vortices. Okay? That will be our, our goal for today. Uh, so um, remember I introduced energy uh, length scales to you. So uh, Psi was the coherence length. And uh, lambda was the penetration depth. So let's think about a, a boundary between a non-superconducting 
part of space and the superconductor. It could be the edge of the superconductor. It could be next to a vortex. Uh, so um, what happens to magnetic field is that it penetrates into the superconductor um, for a distance lambda. Right? But now what happens to this order parameter, to this wave function, is that it grows from 0, which is outside of the superconductor, to some value psi, which is the determined by the density of the condensate and so on, over length scale of this psi. Right. So you have a um, boundary with a normal or vacuum. Um, then it will take a length scale of psi to build up the full order parameter. Is that intuitively clear? I think it's intuitively clear. I, could, I can also derive it for you from the Ginzburg-Landau theory, but I skipped that. You can read about it in Kittel and so on. So, but, but if you think about it, this is the length, size and length scale that these correlations establish between two electrons in a Cooper pair. So if you are too close to the non-superconducting part, uh, then there will be a lot of disturbance to building up Cooper pairs, and that's why, and that's why this happens. So then there are two possibilities for the interplay between these two parameters, lambda and psi. Well, lambda can be greater than psi, or psi can be greater than lambda. And the two situations are shown here. So in the first case, uh, all the magnetic field is already decayed, but the superconducting order parameter, the wave function, is still building up. And in the second case, that superconductor recovers very fast after crossing this boundary, but magnetic field goes pretty far. And we're going to look at the energetics of these two uh, scenarios now. So first, we look at this uh, situation where psi is greater than lambda. We're going to look at the energy at this interface, at the surface energy, essentially. Right? So um, what does Ginzburg-Landau theory and also common sense tell us about uh, the energy of the superconducting state is that um, the system, the superconductor, prefers to be in a superconducting state. Uh, and it prefers it by uh, the energy which is equal to this Fs minus Fn. And that energy, okay, we can express it in terms of magnetic field for uniformity here. Okay, so that is the energy. And so uh, as we go deep into the superconductor, this here... GSC is the energy gain that we get from being in a superconducting state. We gain this much energy. Right? And then we also know that superconductors don't like magnetic fields. So having magnetic field inside a superconductor costs us energy. We have to pay for that. And so the energy that we have to pay goes like this function here. So we have to pay for excluding field because field was zero inside the superconductor. That's because we had to circulate some current and pay some magnetic field energy to, to exclude the field from the superconductor. So we pay actually a lot of penalty for excluding the field when we are deep in the superconductor. But now... At the boundary, because field penetrates, that goes down. So we, at the boundary, we don't pay this energy anymore, and this goes down. Okay? So there are two competing things. So we gain energy by being in a superconducting condensate, but we pay energy for excluding the field. Okay. So uh, now, if we take the difference of these two effects, we will see that there is actually a region here, here, about here, where we pay more energy than we lose, than we gain. So out there, far away, it's all balanced out at the critical field. Uh, but here, close to the um, uh, boundary, we have this energy gain. So that means that uh, we have to pay the price for having a boundary with a normal contact in the case when
coherence length is larger than the penetration depth. We have to pay energy to have a boundary. Now here is the same stuff, but with the two energy scales flipped. So now coherence length is short, and the penetration depth is long. And by the same argument, we can see that here is a region where we gain more energy than we lose if we are at the critical field. We gain energy by having the boundary. Now remember I told you that the, this Landau, uh, Ginsburg-Landau theory works close to the transition. That's why we have this HC here. So we are almost at the transition. Doesn't work as well away from the transition. Okay, so now what is the physical meaning of it? It means that the system wants to have boundaries between normal and superconducting states. Because it, it can gain energy by making them. And that is why there are vortices. So these are the two situations and how you distinguish type 1 from type 2. So type 1 costs you energy to have a boundary. And that's why superconductivity just holds on and doesn't create any extra boundaries inside. Just holds on until it's overwhelmed by magnetic field. And then it, it goes entirely into the normal state. The whole slab of superconductor goes into the normal state because there is no way it will pay extra energy to have boundaries. And now Type 2, you start creating these vortices, creating these boundaries inside, and actually minimizes energy because the boundaries let it gain, uh, gain energy. So this was theorized based on Ginsburg-Landau theory by Abrikosov. Uh, so they're called Abrikosov vortices uh, sometimes. And you can see that uh, typical compounds uh, fall into these two classes where Coherence length is greater than lambda, and this parameter kappa, the Ginsburg-Landau parameter, is then less than uh, 1 over square root 2. Uh, that's a type 1, and uh, things like aluminum, lead, uh, tin are in this class. So you have very large coherence lengths and the smaller penetration depths in these materials, measured or calculated by various things. And so you have... Um, fairly low TC and most remarkably fairly low critical field. So aluminum is overwhelmed at 10 millitesla, no longer superconducts, and these other ones are similar, similar low fields. And now compare that to the, uh, to the class two critical fields of Tesla, 25 Tesla, 130 Tesla. We don't even have magnets that can create these fields to, to reach them, to test them. Um, 14 Tesla, right? So this is because vortices go in and create these boundaries, minimize energy, and let superconductivity last a little longer. Are yeah. the vortices made of individual pairs? So inside the vortex, there is no superconductivity. Yeah. So uh, the superconducting condensate uh, flows around the vortex, yeah. making a vortex, and that is not a single Cooper pair. That is... Um, many, right? But um, all Cooper pairs are in the same wave function. So you can think about one Cooper pair going around the vortex and connecting with itself to be in that wave function, right? But as, as they're bosons, uh, it doesn't pr prevent one billion of them doing that as well. Right? But for each one of them, the flux quantization has to be satisfied. Okay. So this is maybe the last slide. Uh, these are some more data on some practical uh, superconductors. For example, this alloy of niobium and titanium is a technologically very important type two superconductor. So people make wires of this and wind the solenoids, right? And then uh, you can flow a huge current through this 100 amps, for example, uh, without this thing going normal. So then you don't dissipate any heat. And in, this, in the core of the solenoid here, you can create a field which is you know, some, at least some fraction of the critical field. Right? You, maybe you don't want to go all the way to the critical field, but you can be, say, a factor of 10 below safely and run it as a magnet without, uh, that doesn't cost you any energy to run. 
Uh, and so uh, this is what you have in MRI machines. There is actually, in each MRI machine, there is a volume with liquid helium that keeps a, a magnet cold in a superconducting state. And that machine goes to one Tesla uh, and uh, you know, scans your brains and legs and so on. And so this is one application of type II superconductors which came out of Ginsburg-Landau theory and that work thanks to vortices. All right, so we stop here and we talk about more devices, more superconducting devices next week.